Hi everyone, so I am back with uh, yet another lecture and uh, this time we are going to continue uh, on the topic that we have been discussing in last few lectures uh, which is on ultrasonic testing. So before we uh, proceed let us see quickly uh, what we have uh, learned so far. Till last class uh, this is uh, what we had, we first discussed about uh, the basic principle, we have learned about that and then we saw the different kinds of uh, ultrasonic probes. And then in the last class uh, we saw this, uh, the different parts of the test equipment which is used for doing ultrasonic testing, okay. So we will continue on this and we will see the other aspects of uh, this particular technique. So in terms of the incident angle, we saw that uh, there are uh, two scenarios when the incident angle is 0, then this goes uh, vertically down like this, the ultrasonic waves goes into the sample in this fashion and in some cases uh, you need to uh, send the waves at a, a particular angle like this. Okay, because uh, there could be cases uh, as I would have said before also where the defects and flaws might lie at an angle or the part itself is such that you need to uh, send the waves uh, at some angle. Okay. So this is uh, the scenario which is uh, known as a normal probe because uh, the ultrasonic waves are going uh, vertically down perpendicular and this is uh, an angle probe, okay. Right, so uh, depending on uh, what kind of part you have, uh, you know, and what kind of uh, defect orientations uh, you are expecting, so based upon that you could uh, either select a normal probe or an angle probe. So when you uh, send the waves uh, at, at a small incident angle, so across an interface uh, there is a possibility that uh, if you are using longitudinal waves, there is a possibility that at the interface uh, there will be some kind of mode conversion and a part of the longitudinal waves uh, will be converted into uh, transverse wave which are also known as uh, shear waves. When the incident angle is more than 0, okay. So this is uh, a scenario like this. If you are, if you have an incident angle, it is alpha 1, okay, and let us say uh, this encounters an interface between two medium. So, let us say this is medium 1. and it is going into uh, another medium which is here uh, so this is the interface so if you have an incident a small incident angle at this interface then uh, there is a possibility that uh, a part of this uh, longitudinal wave that uh, you have okay, will be converted into shear wave. And across this interface since now it is entering another medium, uh, there will be a change in the path of this wave okay, due to uh, refraction effects. and uh, 
let us say this is the velocity in medium 2 and P L 1 uh, is the velocity in medium 1. Okay. And as I said a small uh, part of this can also be converted into a shear wave or transverse wave. So, this is uh, the transverse wave due to mode conversion. This is the longitudinal wave transmitted into the second medium. and uh, this one is the transmitted transverse wave. Okay. So, when you are using uh, an angle for doing the test, that means uh, because of this mode conversion, two kinds of uh, waves uh, will enter the sample, longitudinal wave and shear wave both of uh, these waves uh, will enter the sample and we have already seen that uh, velocity of uh, shear waves is lower than that of longitudinal waves. Okay. So, that means when these uh, waves reflect back from an interface which could be a discontinuity also, they will arrive at the probe at different time. Okay. So, that means the reflections from the same uh, interface will arrive at different time and you will see them on the screen on the display as the same signal appearing at different times okay, because the velocity is different. So, this will uh, confuse the examiner. Okay. So, this will create a confusion and that is why it is uh, always better to have only uh, one kind of wave going into the sample and coming back to the probe. Okay. So, if you want to do that, uh, when you have this kind of scenario, then you need to exclude uh, one of these waves and as we are going to see now you have to exclude the longitudinal wave and the reason for that uh, we will see in a moment. So, in that case when you do that uh, you have to send it at a particular angle uh, which will ensure that uh, only shear waves enter the sample and the longitudinal waves will be reflected back. They will not be transmitted uh, to the sample. Okay. So, that will uh, depend on uh, the angle of incidence and let us find out uh, what that incidence angle is. Okay. So, let us say this is the incident uh, longitudinal wave and the velocity in medium 1 is V L 1 and then this is the transmitted wave. And this is the incident angle alpha 1. Okay. And as I said a part of this will be converted into shear wave. So, this is uh, the transmitted shear wave. Okay. So, if you want to uh, exclude this uh, transmitted longitudinal wave and only want to keep the shear, then uh, uh, you have to send it at a particular angle and 
that angle can be uh, found from Snell's law. Which says that uh, the ratio of uh, sine angles in these two medium that is sin alpha 1 by sin alpha 2 will be equal to the uh, ratio of the velocities in those two medium. So, this will equal to uh, V L 1 and V L 2, wherein V L 1 is the velocity of the longitudinal waves in medium 1 and V L 2 is the velocity in medium 2. Okay. So, now uh, if you uh, keep increasing uh, alpha 2 or if you keep changing alpha 1 uh, such that alpha 2 increases, at some point alpha 2 will become uh, 90 degree and be parallel to the interface. Okay. So, that particular angle where alpha 2 becomes 90 degree is known as the first critical angle. So, this uh, corresponds to alpha 2 becoming 90 degree. Okay. So, this uh, gives you the first critical angle as sin inverse the ratio of the velocities. Okay. Now, if your ang angle is little more than this, little more than the first critical angle, then uh, this uh, longitudinal beam uh, will be reflected back into the first medium and it will not be transmitted. Okay. So, with respect to medium 1, then it will uh, go through uh, total internal reflection and nothing will be transmitted into the second medium. Okay. So, that means, if your angle is uh, beyond uh, first critical angle, then you can ensure that the longitudinal waves are not entering into the, uh, into the sample which is medium 2. Okay. But if you look at uh, this, the shear waves, there also uh, you could have an alpha 1 at which uh, beta 2 will become 90 degree. Okay. So, the angle at which uh, the beta 2 becomes 90 degree or the transmitted uh, shear wave uh, becomes parallel to the interface, that particular angle is known as second critical angle. Okay. So, this relationship between the incident angle alpha 1 and uh, the transmitted uh, shear wave angle beta 2 is given by again the velocity the ratio of the velocities that is V L 1 and this beta 2 corresponds to uh, the shear wave in medium 2. So, that means this is the velocity of shear waves in medium 2 which we will call as V S 2. Okay. So, the second critical angle that is uh, sin alpha second critical corresponds to beta 2 becoming 90 degree. Okay. So, we have the second critical angle now. which is sin inverse V L 1 by V S 2. Okay. So, if the incident angle is beyond second critical angle, then nothing will enter the medium 2, no ultrasonic wave will enter medium 2. So, that means, if you want to have only uh, shear waves 
entering the sample which is the medium 2, then uh, the incident angle should be in between first critical and second critical angle. So, it should be greater than first critical and lower than second critical. So, it should be in between the first critical and the second critical angle which will ensure that uh, only shear waves enters the sample and then you will do the inspection uh, using shear waves and the confusion that you had that the same signal coming back at uh, different time that can be avoided. Okay. So, in order to do that, you have to ensure that uh, you have only shear waves entering the sample and for that uh, the incident angle has to be in between first critical and second critical angle. So, we will take an example and then see uh, for a, a particular material uh, what could be that angle. Let us say uh, we have a steel sample. and we are using uh, a probe which has this uh, plexiglass face. Okay. So, the front face just in front of the active element if you have seen the construction of ultrasonic waves is uh, some kind of uh, fiberglass kind of thing is there okay, just to uh, protect it and also uh, keep it inside that housing. So, many a times uh, this uh, face material uh, which is in contact with the sample is made of plexiglass and the sample is made of steel. Okay. So, that means our medium one in this case is the plexiglass because the waves will first come out uh, through this plexiglass phase and then it will go to the sample. Uh, so, that is the medium 2 which is in this case steel. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the velocity of sound wave, the longitudinal waves uh, in steel and in plexiglass, these are velocity in plexiglass is uh, 2.67 kilometer per second. Velocity of uh, the longitudinal waves uh, in steel is uh, around 6 or 5.95 kilometer per second and uh, the velocity of uh, shear waves that is V s steel that has to be lower than the longitudinal velocity. So, it is uh, 3.2 kilometer per second. Okay. So, let us uh, calculate uh, the first critical angle and the second, uh, second critical angle for a steel sample where the face of the probe is made of uh, plexiglass. Okay. So, the first critical is sin inverse uh, V L 1 by V L 2. So, that means this is V L 1 is uh, 2.67 because medium 1 is plexiglass 
and uh, V L 2 is 5.95. Okay. So, this will uh, give you an angle which is around 27.5 degrees and the second critical is sin inverse V L 1 by V S 2. So, that is sin inverse 2.67 by 3.2. So, this will give you an angle of around 56 degrees, 56.6 degrees. Okay. So, that means, if you want to inspect this steel sample uh, using an angle probe, so, as I said you need to ensure in that case that only shear waves are entering the sample to avoid that confusion. So, you need to uh, ensure that incident angle is in between uh, 27 and 56. So, an incident angle for this case for the steel sample which is between uh, these two. So, an incident angle like 40 to 45 degree will be good in this case. Okay. So, this will ensure that uh, shear waves are only entering the sample and the whole sample will be inspected by these shear waves. Okay. So, this is how uh, when you do the inspection by using uh, angle probes, this is how you choose the angle depending on the velocity of sound waves into the material that the sample is made of. Okay. The next thing is uh, how do you uh, send these uh, waves into the sample So, when you uh, do the testing, you take the probe. So, this is the transducer you have, this is the sample. Okay. So, you touch it on the sample surface and then you switch it on. So, the waves will be going into the sample, but at this interface as you could realize uh, there is an air gap. Okay. And if this air gap exists, then there will be a decrease in the intensity of the waves or there will be attenuation okay, into the air. So, you need to uh, ensure if you, if you want the entire energy of the sound waves going into the sample and if you want to prevent this attenuation or decrease in the intensity, then you need to exclude this air gap before uh, you could send the sound waves into the sample. Okay. So, in order to exclude this air gap, you need to apply something on this interface which will exclude the air. Okay. So, if you apply uh, some kind of oil or grease or some gel in the form of a thin layer, okay, that will ensure that uh, the air gap is excluded and now this attenuation or the decrease in the intensity can be avoided. Okay. So, this uh, particular thing uh, which is applied to avoid the air gap is known technically as couplant. Okay. So, this couplant should uh, satisfy certain requirements for it to be used effectively and for it uh, to exclude the air gap. So, the couplant must be
coupling must uh, satisfy the following requirements. It should be as thin as possible. to avoid any alteration of uh, direction of the beam. Okay, if it is a thick uh, layer, then that itself would act as a different medium. Okay, and due to the presence of a different medium, then uh, as we have seen before, this uh, sound waves will change their direction. Okay. So, in order to avoid that, uh, you need to ensure that this is applied as a very uh, thin layer, so that uh, the direction of the beam does not change when it is passing through the coupled layer. Then it should wet both uh, the probe surface as well as the sample surface. So, it should have good wetting or good spreading property. Then it should also be able to feel uh, the small uh, irregularities that you might have on the surface of the sample, so that it can provide a smooth surface for the probe to move on. So, this is uh, another advantage you have uh, when you apply this couplant. It will uh, fill up all the irregularities on the surface and it will provide a smooth surface for the probe to move. And it should not restrict uh, the movement of the probe. So, it should allow free movement for the probe. and it must be easy to apply and easy to remove. And it must be harmless to the surface on which it is applied. So, these are the uh, property requirement uh, from a coupling for it to be used effectively. Okay, so, this is how when you do the test, you might have seen that some kind of oil or grease is applied on the surface and then on that uh, the probe transducer will be kept uh, and moved over the surface. Okay. Right, so, this is all I uh, will have for today. So, in the next class again we are going to see the other details of this process. So, for today I will stop here. Thank you for your attention.